Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot Love Mode and today on Hot Love Mode we are coming to you with your reviews and roasts for the Spring 2023 Milan Fashion Week collections. Everybody from Gucci to Prada to Moschino to Bottega to Versace, we got it handled. So let's strap in and just get into it. We'll start with Moschino and Jeremy Scott went full inflatables for Moschino's Spring 2023 collection and it was kind of smart. There's always a kitschy theme when it comes to the brand, and that was what Franco Moschino, the founder and designer, set it up to be. And Jeremy Scott has always channeled that pretty well. This season, the clothes were mostly made up of 1980s inspired skirt suits and pantsuits, but had elements of inflatable plastics embedded. Whether it was on necklines and heart form, in lapels or on smart suits, or just circular rings on cocktail dresses. There were nods to Franco Moschino's original motifs like the question mark and the heart, probably in reference to the Love Moschino secondary line of the brand. The collection then moved to more nautical themes, mostly in reference to the inflatable life raft. So you could see stripes in mini dresses and suits, pocket zippers, and a trench coat, which was even made to look like river rafts, and circular life raft headpieces, which all made one feel like the runway had met white water rafting. The collection also made more nods to the brand's heritage decade of the 1980s through neon colors seen as blow-up sleeves, hems, and entire jackets, while ruching was seen but was also given inflatable bow details to channel that 80s excess. Handbags made of puffer and inflatable fabrics were also pretty smart, as they kept the kitsch of Moschino while also updating the brand's existing accessories segment. And the collection finished off with evening wear that incorporated inflatables, like a purple silk floor-length gown with pink inflatable bows, while a train flows from the back and is in the shape of a pool floaty. The pink floaty dresses with hem bows, opera gloves, and side swags was also rather intriguing. Some of the styles were a little bit uninspired, like an off-the-shoulder mermaid gown, which was gorgeous, but the inflatable dolphins attached to the pannier hips, eh. or the floaty rings with animal motifs layered asymmetrically also felt a bit deflated. I'll close out with what was the most exciting look of the show, the 1930s style halter gown with arm swags with cuff attachments that was then tied to the inflatable theme via the two swan ring floaties with swan necks creating a halo back collar effect. In reality, it was fun. I thought maybe it also might have referenced the whole idea of inflation, seeing as how, you know, the whole world's economy is just very much so inflated. And if so, that's a double entendre I'm very happy to see. So my utmost respect to Jeremy Scott. Next up we have Prada. Now Raph Simmons and Mutra Prada have continued their dance of titans, but they have finally hit the point of synchronage that makes many of the Prada fanboys and fangirls feel like it's all right and it's coming along. They're gonna get right back from where Mutra Prada started from. Now this season was titled Touch of Crude, which could be a nod to Mutra Prada's history of adding pinches, uncouth aesthetics in with her sartorial observations of the bourgeois class as wrinkles, tears, and gaucheness was sprinkled into a rather minimal range of clothes. Boxy tailored jackets opened the collection without much fanfare, which seemed to be Ralph Simmons' is mixing his penchant for oversized tailoring. But later looks exposed that underneath those jackets had almost bodycon button-up jumpsuits that were both awkward and sexy. The same way Prada invented ugly chic, I think it's invented sax word or awkwexy. And I can't tell which one sounds better, but I know that that was the general vibe. But to be fair, these jumpsuits are the definition of defying clothing conventions. To take a traditional button up shirt and turn it into a jumpsuit is something pretty new. But to then cut that jumpsuit to follow the lines of the body, giving this already ungraceful garment a rather weirdly hot feeling? The jumpsuit feels as if they are the result of an incomplete rom-com movie's makeover scene, which feels weird, but oh so endearing. Now to cap off this diatribe about the button-up jumpsuits, Prada is a brand that doesn't need the thrills or gimmicks of a fashion show to make you really feel something when you see its clothes. It might not be awe or lust or immediate love, but it makes you feel something more complex. I know that you're watching this video and you're like, I don't know how I feel, but that's the thing is you're feeling. And that is pushing the needle forward 
in my opinion. We stand. Dip dyed motifs appeared on dresses with white sections materializing close to the neckline and hem and is probably a reference to dip dye and tie dye styles found in the spring 2004 collection, which wanted to look back on craftsmanship at the time. But Prada and Simmons seem to have replaced the happy Italiana mama essence of spring 2004 and went a bit cruder with harsh colors like brown and chartreuse, which are colors that Prada herself loves and which are hard to stomach and that's also partially why she loves that. And the manner in which the dye callously seems to be placed continues to push this notion of general unrefinement even though it's in a beautiful silk. Knitwear in simple corporate colors like gray and brown were seen in sweater and skirt form, but they were heavily wrinkled, almost like when you take your sweaters out during the fall and winter seasons. And with the sweater sleeves looking like they had never even heard of a dry cleaner, and wrinkles so pronounced they looked like they were genuine gashes ripping through these knits rather than just wrinkles. Now speaking of gashes, a navy blue skirt set seemed particularly mangled as we could see the neckline of the cardigan and skirt slit lining looked like it had been chewed through. Now there is provenance for the wrinkling and it comes in the form of the brand's spring 2009 collection which utilized metal threads to hold a permanent wrinkle in the garments. Something that is the antithesis of quote unquote proper dressing which is why Mutra Prada is so amazing because the woman literally said yeah I know I come from like one of the richest families in Italy but like my clothes are gonna be wrinkled and I'm gonna make sure that from a technical standpoint they stay that way. She's so cool. Now some might question why a luxury brand would do such a thing but in reality Mutra Prada has been questioning luxury and what we consider luxury by examining these upper class dressing codes for decades. Wearing deformed knits like these seem to do that quite efficiently because I think everybody's sitting at home saying why the f would you pay for that? But it's because it's Prada and it's smart, that's why. There were clutch coats, another Prada staple since its first collection, in brown and gray, with wrinkles as well, while boxy cocktail dresses with odd and unfinished looking drapings aren't great, but I don't believe that they're supposed to look that way, or at least they're supposed to look great. Again, quote, a touch of crude strikes. Now, nightgowns were given the Prada treatment with a sheer version in light pink exposing the body underneath, essentially defeating the purpose, while a black opaque silk version is rather reminiscent of black nylon, a Prada fabric staple as well. The placement of the Prada triangle at the forefront of garments has become more and more common under Rap Simmons, with the black version having the metal triangle placed over a part lace, part silk neckline, while the sheer version had a Prada triangle made entirely, entirely, out of lace surrounded by sweet lace roses. I commend Prada and Simmons for being able to play with such an iconic symbol of the brand and allow it to be transformed and adapted as that's what is really needed in order to keep house codes fresh. Like I'd pay for just the lace Prada triangle. You know what I, mean? I don't even need the garment. I'll just the triangle, I'll frame it, hang it up. Now, since Raph Simmons' appointment at the helm of Prada, its origin as a leather goods brand has been played upon season after season. Now, this season, collarless leather skirt sets and coat dresses were shown in black and felt dowdy, especially when placed next to the square collar coats in black and chartreuse. 3D floral appliques were placed onto white skirt sets and dresses that had colored shirts placed underneath. While Prada has always played with florals, these versions were too scant to feel anything but an afterthought and kind of uncomfortable looking. Yes, maybe it does have a touch of crude to it, but there are limits to everything now. Floral dresses in green and red had the purposeful wrinkles, but also might have been a reference to the brand's fall 2005 collection. White outlines on the slits, exposed backs, and necklines this season are a reminder of the white spots that looked like they had missed the dyeing process back in 2005. And again, we can see that Mucha and Raph are in a constant state of self-reference, and it's impressive. The collection finished out with black gowns and blazers that were given trains, and while one would ask for more of a bang at the end of a collection, Prada has never really been a bouffant gown sort of brand, and I think that these styles are about as bang as you're gonna get. And it seems that Simmons and Prada know to leave those wow evening wear moments for custom red carpet creations that on occasion adapt the runway versions that they send out. So it'll come, just gotta wait. All in all, Prada this season seemed subdued, but Prada runways have been happening for 30 plus years and there have been minimal periods. They aren't just discussed as often as the more exciting collections that are so, so memorable, like Ugly Chic and the Spring 2011 and all that sort of jazz. It's hard for me to lambast the brand for going back to 
a different section of its roots. I thought the devil was in the details of this collection, and they were crude, but covetable. Next up is Bottega Veneta. Now, Mathieu Blasi sent out his sophomore collection for Bottega Veneta, and it was a solid weaving in of his already unassuming image for the brand. Bottega Veneta has always been a brand about whispering wealth. They I mean the ad campaigns from the 1970s and 1980s with the slogan, quote, when your own initials are enough, should be proof that Bottega is a brand that focuses on craft rather than name recognition. Lazi's more subtle approach has effectively encompassed that this season. The collection began with a reminder of Blazy's focus on textile development. Rather than showboating his, quote, jeans from last season that were not made of denim, but rather leather, was re-upped in slouchy boyfriend jean form and khakis with front crease that also got the leather treatment too. But the flannels that both models, one being the legendary Kate Moss, wore looked like rather run-of-the-mill flannels that you could find at your local PacSun in your local mall, but Upon closer inspection, you can see that the flannel's actually made of leather. While some might say, okay, who cares? I care. Leather is a fabric often associated with handbags and shoes in today's fashion climate, but it's rather daring nowadays to wear leather out and about. For whatever reasons, it's become something not very relatable. Even though leather is one of the oldest textiles humans have been interacting with since at least the Ice Age. But with Blasi's Bottega, leather can be normalized through its association with modern wardrobe staples that are deemed easy, accessible, and everyday wear, if you can afford Bottega. And Blasi achieves his goal in making his leather flannels front a relatability, because his dedication to textile development is seen in the fact that only upon touch can one really truly discern that these are not just your regular flannels. That is fashion with a U, baby. That's it. Now, more traditional leather styles came in a brown fitted trench coat, blue wrapped skirt, and a Marchese light green suit, and will more than likely cost a pretty penny, but will also act as investment pieces for clients. And non-leather wardrobe staples came in black flowy dresses, a navy blue knit sweater paired only with tights, and a curvaceous black pantsuit. More experimental leather styles then emerged with a skirt and coat set in black, looking like it had been made from exotic animal skin, but is more than likely Mathieu Trompe-Loet embossing or embroidering the fabric to look like a pebble leather, while a double-breasted skirt suit and coat in a gray plaid again is made entirely of leather, essentially reworking a tailoring staple into a leather one. And I do have to talk about one singular menswear look, because the fact that this argyle sweater wrapped around the model is also made out of leather makes me feel like I'm on a new Netflix reality show called Is It Leather? And if that show goes into production, I would like to be cast. Please and thank you. Then knits materialized and came with folded over necklines that had graphic beaded fringe flowed down the folds and the hem. They are bright and bold and brash and are some of the more showy looks that Blasi offers to clients looking for eye-catching styles. And he has diversified them as well by creating two-piece skirt sets, tasseled flare pantsuits, and double-breasted coats, meaning they can become statement pieces in a range of garment form. Bottega Veneta is a brand all about texture. Seen in bags like the staple Interreccio weave, as well as the newer coil bags, but also in clothes like draped dresses in smooth leather and suede. Sharp tailored wool styles emerged in a black suit, beige button down and slacks, and a gray blazer dress, all with a subtle but curved collar that emits an all-knowing cool. Monochrome leathers were textured into two different ways. The first is that floral appliques were placed all over the red leather dress and gloves that we can see here, and that cyan leather skirt with dangling tassels being created via the faux flower stems. But the other texture was the cutouts in the leather that makes the flowers look like they are about to fall out of the leather while in the midst of being cut. In reality, I think these are more of the show pieces that Bottega is often accused of lacking. And I hope to see versions of them on the red carpet. A trio of sheer white dresses were embroidered with floral appliques and beaded fringe sections in purple and cyan and yellow. And the finale trio of looks are reminiscent of midi skirts we saw last season from Bottega that were some of the most controversial. Not for their leather tassel underskirts, but for their $30,000 price tag. But this season, a sunshine yellow sleeve bodice lays over a full leather tassel skirt, while a red halter style top with hourglass figure did the same thing. They are great star quality styles that can be both sexy and conservative and might entice customers to step outside of their comfort zones just a little bit. A cyan halter dress closed the show out, but it was a 
fully leather tassel dress, and I think it's one we can expect to see on a red carpet hopefully soon. Showcasing that while Mathieu Blasi's Bottega is all about subtlety in a commercial sense, it understands the appeal of celebrity and red carpet attention. Blasi's Bottega is a textile juggernaut that focuses on product appeal and keeps within the brand's history for less than flashy fashion. But he is also aware that excitement propels reputation, and he's willing to do it his way. Then there was Farragamo. Maximilian Davis, the British fashion wunderkind, debuted his first collection for the Italian brand Ferragamo, formerly Salvatore Ferragamo, who just recently dropped the founder's first name. Ferragamo historically is a shoe company founded by Salvatore in 1929, and quickly became the shoemaker to Hollywood stars, with the likes of Ava Perone and Marilyn Monroe as just some of its notable clients. While no stars materialized on the runway, beige looks in the Maximilian fashions did, with a double-breasted wide leg suit with matching tan coat and button-up and tie and gloves and bags and shoes in tow started the collection off with a tailored bag. Maximilian Davis did put his own brand that made waves through the British fashion incubator Fashion East on hold in order to focus on Ferragamo. His modern tailored styles are making their way to Ferragamo through moments like this tan boxy jacket with draped miniskirt that is reminiscent of cutout miniskirt suits that Davis has been playing with for years now. Davis has always done his tailoring work out of London, working with tailors he grew up around. But with Ferragamo, he is able to flex his muscles a bit more freely, and I'll give him some time to find the rhythm of working with them. Davis also showcased quite a bit of suede, a luxurious leather, in tan and black trench coat formats that were drool worthy. But please just don't drool on the suede, thank you. As for the red suede dress and tan skirt set, they might be a reference to the brand's use of suede since at least the late 1930s, like this red and gold wedge. Maximilian has a tough job of reviving a brand for young and cool customers who he excites, and also building a brand story for them while making clothing that they and history and Ferragamo clients will want to wear. While the use of suede might not be an exact reference to an iconic shoe or moment for the house, it is recontextualizing a house code that has existed for minimum 80 years. Then two catsuit looks emerged and were smart to emphasize not the fashion necessarily, but the accessories, which is what Maximilian's truest mission is. In order for a brand like Ferragamo to succeed in this new rebrand, Maximilian must find the accessories that sell like hotcakes. Think Bottega by Daniel Lee, a relatively flat brand until he spun the subtle styles into the hottest bags and shoes on the market at the time. Maximilian must do that, and I think between his cutout tote bag in white and red suede handbag with Gancini hardware, he's working to showcase accessories as a vital artery for the brand's success. Now, if we look down, we can also see that a new shoe, as previously mentioned, a Ferragamo staple, has also emerged, and its appearance is rather intriguing. The strappy sandal in a range of colors from black to red is normal, but the circular heel is intriguing and also a signature symbol of Ferragamo. It's called a gancini, which means a small hook, and was first seen in the 1950s, but became part of Ferragamo handbags as a clasp in 1969. An enlarged version, becoming a circular heel, is similar to other luxury brands incorporating their logos as heels and it's smart. We'll just have to wait to see if customers bite though. Swimwear was also seen, which is another carryover from Davis's own brand, with a simple black style similar to Maximilian styles from times past, which bolstered an ombre two-piece set with an enthralling white and orange dip dye motif and a long flowing ombre cover-up over a red pair of bikini bottoms. Maximilian is smart to push for swimwear as a important category for Ferragamo, as it's one that is usually ignored by other fashion brands and he could corner a nice segment of the market. Dresses with headscarves and hoods came in different forms with the first to be seen in those dip dye styles that are whimsical and eye-catching. Besides from their striking orange and blue vertical motif, that runs down the front, the halter neck that folds into the headpiece is brilliant, and with the pairing of the pants underneath might possibly be an attempt to attract more conservative customers. As for the asymmetrical styles that consist of strapless dresses with faux straps morphing into headpieces, they're much simpler, but the ability to create a hood or head wrap could again spark the interest of customers that prefer to cover up a little bit more for any plethora of reasons. Obviously, to really get these customers to don these sort of wares, they need to be adapted, but 
that really is not too difficult off the runway when it comes to buying appointments buyers will have with the brand. More ombre styles came in through asymmetrical draped dresses, both short and long in red and blue, while a heat reactive set, which you might recognize because of Zendaya wearing it, links in with this idea of bleeding colors and ombres that has been consistent throughout this whole collection so far. The Gancini was seen in sheer on a slash tailored jacket bustier and pant, and also seen on Dua Lipa recently, proving that Ferragamo has become a player in the celebrity red carpet dressing space, and it's been what, a little over a month? Tops? The sparkle was brought in crystallized red pants, which I think will become a Ferragamo signature from here on out as well. And also, I just had a thought. Maybe it's a reference to the ruby red slippers from the Hollywood classic The Wizard of Oz, and how Ferragamo would make a, quote, rainbow sandal for Judy Garland in the 1970s? I don't know, just, you know, it's just how my mind works. I have no clue if this was Maximilian's intention, but that's how the story is gonna go for me, and I'm gonna keep pushing it. And the collection closed out with a trio of flowy dresses with ovular sheer panels in the center that were gridded with crystals to make these styles shine. They weren't immaculate, but they definitely kept up the energy of draping and crystals that were present earlier. For a debut collection, Maximilian did a brilliant job. He excited a brand that has fallen out of popular favor, brought in new accessories that could genuinely rev clients' engines, and some that even I want, and did a pretty solid job of building his own house codes for the brand. Here's to the new era of Ferragamo. I'm gonna be watching very closely. And then we had Gucci. Now, Alessandro Michele is always a bit kooky when he showcases a Gucci collection, and this season obviously was no different. His model casting consisted entirely of twins, who wore matching glitzy and grandma glammy looks in unison exciting his audience. The collection began with two-piece suits with traditional blazers in double-breasted fashion, but with gartered pant legs, which were a pretty smart way to continually re-energize the suit. Now, Gucci understands that tailoring is a big part of their business. I mean, remember when Harry Styles did specific tailoring campaigns for Gucci? Michele seems to keep rewriting the rules of one of the oldest forms of clothing making and mixing garters, traditionally seen in more private settings, with a classic suit which defies the buttoned up notion that tailoring in general seems to have. Speaking of tailoring, the more rigid belted pantsuits in white and black were certainly less scandalous than the first two looks, but customers looking to not create shock and awe might find them appealing. Motifs were odd, like the hardware nuts or wrenches mixed with lipsticks in bold colors, but it's Gucci. It would be strange to expect anything but strange. Plus, Michele both enlarging the lipsticks and putting them alongside wrenches, which Michele smartly differentiated from Prada's own version from years past, was a good idea. A double-breasted crop top jacket with exposed hip strings was a nice and more corporate take on Tom Ford's iconic spring 1998 styles and proves that Michele can continually tap into Ford's transformative vision for the brand without making it feel redundant. Metallic fabrics were seen in a range of styles from bib tops with double slit skirts in bright pink to gold pleated tunic tops with red Chinese knot buttons to silver sharp shouldered front wrapped gowns which all prove that Michele is hesitant to let go of his love for the decadence associated with the 1980s. There also was a heavy influence of historical Asian textile art, most likely inspired by ancient Chinese embroideries, in low rise skirts, bib tops, and floral silk floor length coats, which Michele has referenced before. Michele also showcased the Qi Pao, which is also known as the Chiang Sam and can be traced to 20th century China. The Qi Pao is a modern adaptation of dress worn by Manchu women from the Qing dynasty, so in reality it might be a more modern take on Chinese traditional dressing, but it still very much so has historical roots. Michele chose to recontextualize the garment in crop tops, hybrid marching band uniforms with elements of the Chi Pao structure, and flowing pleated gowns with a Chi Pao bodice. Now, with fashion's history of cultural appropriation, styles like these give one pause. But at the same time, Gucci has been incorporating these design elements into their collections since at least 2016. In reality, it's really up to the Chinese diaspora to decide whether these reimaginations of traditional decorative arts and cultural dress is unacceptable or not. I don't have the ability to tell you whether or not these styles truly are appreciative or appropriative, but I also think that it's important that we highlight at least the history of these garments and where they come from. Now, Gucci Gremlins also made a landing as a blue dress's hem was invaded by the face of the 1984 horror classic creature, Gizmo, 
from the Gremlins movie. If you thought the 1980s would be leaving Gucci anytime soon, I think this is your sign to forget about that idea. Now we'll finish discussing the collection with a draped gown that Michele showed in light brown held together by rings and a blue pleated gown that was rather lovely which showcased Gucci's evening wear styles will be light, flowy, and all about texture. All in all, it was your usual Gucci showing. Nothing too crazy as far as Gucci goes, but if you'd rather not see it, I'd advise keeping it away from water, because if you get it wet, they'll probably multiply. Then we had Diesel. Now the Belgian Glenn Martins opted for a more demure collection for his most recent Diesel show, but he still proved that he understands how to manipulate the brand's most important house code. That's denim if you didn't know. Diesel's denim degradation was apparent with an opening look made up of a bra and high-waisted jean that at certain sections was transparent. The bra had sections that exposed the model's skin underneath, while the jean corset hybrid pant exposed parts of the waist and pelvis, which was pretty ravishing. Acid wash has been around since at least the 1980s and has always been associated with denim. And it's made by adding denim in with pumice stones and a weak solution of bleach into like a tumbler. And you know, you don't add any water to it and that just sort of cycling of it gives it that color. Now a jute or jean boot with oversized jacket, a denim skirt suit with a corseted bone jacket, and a drop waist A-line jean dress all redefined how denim clothing outside of jeans should be seen. It can be hard to make denim on denim not look like the quote Canadian tuxedo or without looking just sad, but Martins is doing it efficiently. Each piece strays very far from the little house on the prairie idea we have of denim on denim, and I appreciate him for it. The denim strip bustier and degrading cocktail dress that looks like denim plush were sweet as well. And more denim manipulations came in a vertical frayed gray dress and a blue skirt with a trompe l'oeil frayed top, which aren't super desirable, I would say, to the everyday customer, but it's an exploration of the material, so points are awarded. But the vertical stitches that make the fabric look like it's vertically is something I haven't ever seen, and even more points for that. Crocodile stomach scales materialized on a blue dress, which honestly is still very much one of the most ravishing pieces from Milan, while a green belt skirt recreated the silhouette of a crocodile in green. And while the brand is historically about jeans, Martins is finding ways to incorporate more luxe textiles, but in a humble denim. And again, textile development is important. It doesn't always have to be showy, crazy, over the top, ridiculous. Textile development is hot and sexy and should be appreciated. The chromatic styles from Martins' first Diesel show came in a pink vest, a green dress with embossed jean waistband motifs, and Diesel logo belt skirt in silver. Blue denim was frayed so much that a coat, jacket, and skirt were given elegant trim, almost like the fur trims of the past, but denimified. It's a word I just made up and I like it. And the bold denim frayed coats from last season that looked like fur that we very much loved were actually again seen just in cotton and they came back in a, in a bright pink while a bandeau and mini skirt frayed set was done in gray. Overall, Glenn Martins went simpler this season, but his emphasis on reforming the image of denim deserves a lot of credit and I'm excited to see what comes next. There was Fendi, I'm not discussing Fendi. I made a short, I made a TikTok, I made a reel about both of those collections, the one in New York, the one in Milan. I'm still emotionally drained from it. Not good, bad. I think a cry for help. So I apologize, but I'm good. And we'll finish off the video with Versace, collection by Donatella Versace that went in a goddess gone grunge mentality, at least according to the brand. The collection began with black dresses with singular slashes cutting through the bodices diagonally in what appears to be an ode to the brand's spring 1994 collection by Gianni Versace himself. Johnny's own dresses were usually gowns and were held together via his signature safety pins made famous by none other than Liz Hurley, but Donatella opted to leave the pins out, which is actually kind of appreciated. As the drape and the locations of the slits become the main focus, and the drape, it was nice. It was slinky and sexy and Versace and I'm into it. A hooded version of the dress with an asymmetrical neckline and side slit, as well as another diagonal slit dress in cocktail form with a leather coat placed over top is simple, yes but will make buyers' lives much easier. Leather pants with hip fringes and a leather mini skirt and moto jacket with back fringe definitely has a Western vibe and is probably a nod to Versace's spring 1992 collection. Cowl neck dresses in black and purple were slinky and sexy and were fine, but the floral gowns with high slits placed over top of pants were awkward. Versace himself might have played on 1970s proportions of tunic dresses over pants in the past, but the provenance doesn't sell the styling here unfortunately. Purple leather pants, a strapless cocktail dress, and strapped sheer dress were fringed. Not all were bad, but they also weren't great. They were just existing. And faux fur coats were created through the piling of swatches of fabric on top of each other in purple and black, which clients might enjoy. But again, 
Wah. Lace and silk baby doll 90s were done in black, purple, and bright pink, but were wrinkled, indicating that not steaming your clothes before you leave the house is certainly in this coming season. The dresses were also another reference to Gianni's Spring 1994 collection, which saw wrinkled baby dolls in silk and lace in a similar manner. Now, I presume Donatella tapped these styles because it fit in with her idea of the grunge subculture. Now, these modern versions aren't bad, they just don't have the same appeal as the original versions. Although, I appreciate Donatella bringing forgotten styles to the forefront of our minds. I do. The black and purple gown slip dresses were also giving a little bit more of an evening wear appeal to the collection, and again, reference spring 1994, and I'm sure we'll see styles like this on the red carpet going forward. And then Paris Hilton, heiress, DJ, and diva herself closed the collection out in a pink Oraton cocktail dress. Oraton is a chainmail fabric that Versace himself developed and learned to drape, which gives the metal fabric an intriguing texture. Hilton wore a draped chainmail dress by Julian McDonald to her 21st birthday party, which very much so has become a hit Y2K reference image and outfit, but Donatella and Versace probably wanted to recontextualize the style in a manner that cemented Paris in the fabric with the Versace brand, which I think is smart. It's good you know, making new memories. But I do believe that the look could have been a little bit more profound. Doing versions of Paris's original dress on models and platinum blonde wings could have been an amazing and great way to tap the look's clout, but not giving Paris a real eleganza extravaganza moment to close out the show that had been evolved and adapted for her had a little bit of a deflated feeling. The draped neckline oraton dress with lace hem trim just doesn't have one saying, that's hot. So that is the end of this Milan Fashion Week, spring 2023 roast. I'm trying to think if there's like a best collection. I'm gonna put it down to Ferragamo. I'm gonna put in there Bottega. As for worst, Fendi, easy peasy, done. I just wanna say thank you guys so much for watching. I appreciate your patience with these little Fashion Week videos. They take a little bit of time, but I do find that they're worth it and I enjoy doing them. I will see you guys for the Paris video, which might take a little bit longer because there's more shows to cover, but don't worry, it will come, I promise. So I will see you guys on the next one and TTYL.